Hi there, and welcome to the T21 Mom Podcast. Today's episode is number 52. My name is Mary, and I'll be your host. Each episode, we'll talk about life, Down syndrome, single parenting, mamahood, and pretty much everything in between. And as always, or most of the time, my friend Ron is also joining us today. Hi, Ron. Hey, Mary. Um, I'm just going to ask this flat out. How are you feeling after your incident? After my injury, I- I'm doing okay. Well, it's 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 an incident. It, this is worse than an injury. This yeah. In, this this involves, you know, plates and screws and surgery and. Hmm. Yeah, I was. I missed a step. I was carrying a box, not very heavy, and I missed a step or kind of half missed it and went down really hard. And I broke several bones in my foot and my fibula is displaced, which I think also means it's broken. And yeah, so I had surgery. I've got some screws and I think at least one plate in there. And yeah. And a letter from the doctor for security screeners at the airport. <laughs> yeah, I might need that, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And a lot of medication, you know, for the pain. How's that but working it, for the wine consumption? Not so good. You know, I asked <laughs> at the hospital, <laughs> I said, can I have a glass of wine? Like this is after the surgery. And they go, no, you should probably wait after, until, because, you know, there's some of these medications are narcotics, so you should probably wait. I go, okay. So that's been put on the shelf for at least a few more days. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, just to call if you need anything, right? Thank you. I, I will. Okay. <laughs> it's been uh, tough. Yeah, it, it's it's been hard uh, hobbling around. And, and you got well, that special little device to help you too, don't you? A little kneely, yeah, because I tried crutches and I already fell once on the crutches, so that wasn't good. And the kneely is great; I can I can get around pretty and, good and, on that. And what do you do with that kneely? Because because like this is, I've seen it. It's a it's a. Like it's a, almost like a, a scooter. scooter without a foothold. Yeah, you scooter for your knee. Yeah. So you put your you put your bad knee up on the on the seat, and so your good leg, which isn't really that good because I also sprained that one pretty good. They thought I actually had broken both feet. Luckily I didn't. And, uh, that pushes you around. So, and it's a little basket. So it's actually quite convenient. It folds up nicely in the car so you can get around. So I'll be using that for probably the next two months. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Thanks. Yeah, me too. I'm even more sorry that you can't drink the wine, but (laughs) Yeah, me too. <laughs> it so is what it is. Have, today we have an interesting show. We're talking with some really accomplished uh, people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're talking with Susan Wang. She is a special Olympian and she has won a bronze medal in downhill skiing, which I think is fantastic. I can't even ski. Well, especially now I can't ski. You know, and she's very accomplished and she's gone to events all over the world. But we also talk about what the Special Olympics is. Like, it's not just about every four years they have this big sporting event, somewhat like the Olympics, which will be later this year in Tokyo, but about creating a sense of community and getting kids active and, you know, enjoying sports and and getting involved, you know, where they can be part of a team and just having fun and getting active and fit. So they don't like the the Special Olympics still happens every four years, but it doesn't happen at the same site as like the Olympics and the Paralympics. Completely different entities, but the Special Olympics have events all the time, but they're world Special Olympics, if you want to call it that. It happens on the same cycle as the Olympics, like every four years where they have a international event but they also have you know provincial events uh national events and so on for the special olympics so and there's lots of things to go on and then you know and up until they're 12 you just do a whole 
bunch of different types of activities and and then when you're 12 that's when you sort of pick an event that you want to focus on that that that's where you would compete in so to speak okay so susan would have gone through all of that and then mm -hmm. yeah. at 12 she would have chosen downhill skiing yes yeah and she's very accomplished so which i thought was just amazing so yeah and and who is our other guest scott Howe. he is with the special olympics of bc so he's going to talk about the arrangement the like the arrangements the the structure the yeah. the organization yeah he talks a lot about the organization and how you can get involved because i certainly want to get ainsley involved and also does she you know, know about that no <laughs> <laughs> but I think she'd be good with it and you know and I would love to get also involved in the organization in some way I mean I don't have a ton of time but I think it's a really amazing organization and I come from you know a sporting family so I think it would be a wonderful way to to be involved well and even even your past history with you know gymnastics coaching and stuff like that I mean that that really brings a lot to the table right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just on a totally separate side note, like when I was uh, coaching and, you know, it was high school, gymnastics was the only team sport where you didn't have to qualify to be on the team. So everyone could participate because it was kind of like the Special Olympics. You, you, you show uh, up, you get to play. Yeah, you show up, you get to play and you go, you're in levels based on your ability for like in when we were coaching in in high school so all kids could participate and you know we had a couple of kids on our team who had some special needs who were who were differently abled and you know they were they went to the provincials which was a big deal to go to the bcs so you know and i'm i'm really proud of that i did that for gosh i think i was a coach for probably 12 years i think so yeah it's it's important and i think it's it's important to have our get our kids active because often they can be a little bit uh, sedentary and sedentary thank you and it's okay you're excused <laughs> because of the medication okay thanks and also you know sometimes often uh people with down syndrome they have a lower intrinsic motivation so i think it's a great way to get them involved and to get them excited about something and there's all different types of sports that you can get involved in when you're 12 and over but they have lots of different community events it gets them to the house it gets yeah them, like and it gets some like it's it's like play date with purpose exactly yeah okay well why don't we go talk to uh scott and susan okay let's Today on the T21 Mom podcast, we have two very special guests. Scott Howe is the Health Stakeholder Engagement Consultant for the Special Olympics of BC, and Susan Wang is a Special Olympics athlete. Welcome, Scott and Susan. Thanks for having us. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm so glad that you both could come on today. Uh, so, Scott, can you first tell us a little bit about you and your role at the BC Special Olympics? <laughs> Um, yeah, I actually grew up around the Special Olympics, and not because I um, have a family member who's a participant, but um, my father was actually very involved in starting the Special Olympics BC chapter. So our family's been involved here in the programs for about 40 years. Wow. Um, growing up, it was mostly just kind of volunteering at individual events here and there and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, but once I finished university, I came back and I slowly started working on some health programs for Special Olympics. And over time, as I started to learn kind of what the status quo was and how much work still needed to be done, I started to get a little bit passionate about it. So now I work uh, quite a bit on some health programs for Special Olympics, trying to get um, an organization called the Champions for Inclusive Health Stakeholder Coalition going. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, an attempt to uh, bring different agencies and organizations together to try and um, improve the health of people with intellectual disabilities through collective action. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that role, I also um, am responsible for the Special Olympics BC Youth Engagement Project. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we have a team of about 15 youth from around the province who all receive some support and funding um, from Special Olympics. And their job is to develop and implement some inclusion-based projects in their communities. Um, so this is the second year that we've run that program and we're just getting started now. 
Wow, that's fantastic. And that you've had such a long history with the Special Olympics of BC. So, wow, that's that's really cool. I had no idea. And Susan, can you tell us briefly about your involvement with the Special Olympics of BC and what sports you've been involved in and where these led to? Sure. Um, the sports I have done in the past includes bowling, softball, and floor hockey. Mm -hmm. But the sports I am currently in are alpine skiing and track and field. Throughout my nine years as a, in Special Olympics, I have been to many games regionally and professionally. Mm -hmm. um, in alpine skiing, I have competed in nationals and the internationals, which was so much fun. I have also been in events for track and field, such as going to the BC Games mm -hmm. in 2016 and competing in the Herodrome. Oh, wow. Um, and throughout these experiences, mm -hmm. it has led me to being in many TV interviews, such as CTV, Global Morning News, and Breakfast Television. Additionally, I have been in newspapers, and I have been interviewed on a radio station. Oh, fantastic. As aside from being interviewed, mm -hmm. I have public spoke at different events, such mm -hmm. as fundraising events. Mm -hmm. I have also co emceed for the Newmont Invitational Golf Tournament and the Sports Celebrities Festival. Oh, wow. So you've done a lot, and, and I have a personal involvement I guess with Harry Jerome because we as, as we were talking before we started is I come from a, a running family I just run for fitness but all my brothers were competitive runners and so Harry Jerome we would we went to that uh, meet many times over the years and it's fantastic so wow wonderful but uh, didn't you get a medal Susan? I did yeah I got a bronze medal in the internationals in Austria that is amazing in obviously in in the alpine skiing is that correct uh yes wow that is fantastic and and i can't really ski very well to save my life so kudos to you that is amazing <laughs> so <laughs> and i'm just <laughs> and i'm just curious what is it that you do for track and field um i do the uh, 100 meters mm -hmm. 200 400 sometimes the 800 shot put and long jump. Oh, wow. That's great. So you're a sprinter. So that's fantastic. Wow. Good for you. So, you know, back in 2019 and, you know, Susan, you probably don't know about this, but I went to, a, it's called a rock and mums retreat. And I've talked about it on previous episodes. It's, it's a, a retreat where moms of children with Down syndrome all get together and it's a really fantastic time for us moms. And at the last year's retreat, Tim Shriver, Timothy Shriver, he actually gave the opening note, I guess, or, you know, he gave the opening speech. And it was really very moving to hear from him and to hear how his mom, Eunice, actually founded the Special Olympics. And so, Scott, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the history of the Special Olympics and how it came to be and also the beginnings of the Special Olympics. Like you said, your family was involved. So I'm really curious to hear about that. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'd start by saying is at around the time that the Special Olympics was really um, getting started, which would have been 1968 mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, at that time, the general public didn't assume that people with intellectual disabilities generally were capable of very much. There was a lot of assumptions that, you know, people wouldn't be able to play sports. It's too mm -hmm. stressful. Um, people are at an increased risk of injury. So against that um, background, yeah. Eunice Shriver um, started a, an event at Chicago's Soldier Field, I believe. Um, and that was the very first um, Special Olympics event that happened. Um, and on a, over time, that single event kind of grew into the movement that we know as Special Olympics today. Mm -hmm. um, so now, uh, Special Olympics is in, I believe, more than 160 countries. Wow. Um, there's every single province in Canada has its own chapter, same with the U.S. Um, and around the world. So um, it's really grown from that kind of grassroots, small Sorry, my dog is just barking in the background it's a okay. little. I apologize. It's okay. I got Ainsley in the background here too. It's all good. It's all about working from home. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, it kind of started with um, that that same idea of inclusion mm -hmm. um, and, and trying to counter people's beliefs about what it means to have an intellectual disability and what people with intellectual disabilities are capable of. Um, so 1968 would have been when it started globally. Here mm -hmm. in BC, it started in 1980. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, it was about three annual events that would kind of take place over a weekend. And mm -hmm. much like the global movement, that has slowly grown into what it is today, where we have, um, I believe, 18 sports all around the province, and they're operating year-round. So it's no longer just these individual weekend events. Okay. Um, people uh, who want to be involved in our programs can, can do so year-round. That's fantastic. So one of the things I was wondering is how, I know you sort of um, touched on it, but how often are the Special Olympics held? Like the, I guess the big events that like Susan was in, like the national, the regional, national, and even the international events. Mm -hmm. So the bulk of what we do is uh, at the community level mm -hmm. um, in the, all across the province, we have, you know, gyms and, and fields, there's Special Olympics programs happening and, um, that would uh, be the main part of our programming for the right. people who do want to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, we do operate on a four-year cycle that would be similar to the Olympics in oh, terms okay. of um, advancing through the competition. So people would start um, in the year-round programs at the regional level. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they progress through that, they will go to the provincial level and the national level. And uh, if you're as successful as Susan, you will go on to the World Games. Mm -hmm. Um, and those take place every four years with the winter and summer games happening two years apart. Oh, so same as very similar to uh, um, the World Olympics that I was wondering about that. I, I thought for sure it wasn't every four years. So that's really fantastic to hear. I'm yeah. So when I mean, granted, we were supposed to have the World Games this year in 2020. So does the Special Olympics, I guess, on the, more of on the international scale or even the national scale, do they coincide with the same year as the Olympic year, like for the summer events? Not generally, no. Um, so our programs are run entirely separate from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not sure if they ever do align, but if they do, it would not be a, a planned thing. Um, right. Our four-year cycle operates independently. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So what is special... Special Olympics BC, so SOBC for short, because it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> uh, what is their mission? So our mission at Special Olympics BC is uh, Special Olympics BC is dedicated to enriching the lives of individuals with intellectual disability through sport. Um, so again, we're not just a sports organization. Um, we see ourselves as a vehicle for inclusion and mm -hmm. empowerment. Um, and sports is the way that we do that. Yes, and I think that's fantastic. And, you know, I, maybe you can both answer this, but I think also maybe Susan in particular, but what do you think defines a special Olympian? Um, I think that, um, I think that what defines someone who's in Special Olympics is that they are really determined and hardworking and they accept everyone who, for who they are. Fantastic. Yes. And, and Scott, would you say the same? Yeah, um, I think Susan kind of nailed it. Mm -hmm. um, when I spend time at Special Olympic events, the thing that always stands out to me is inclusion and acceptance. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of judgment going on and everyone seems to be very supportive of each other and mm -hmm. accepting of people's differences. And it's a really cool environment to be around. Yes, I can only imagine. So I, I'm, I'm sure it's amazing to be part of such an event and so Susan you have been to as you said in the beginning a number of different events all at different levels from the BC Winter Special Olympics all the way to the World Winter Special Olympics as you said in Austria which I think is so fantastic is there something that stands out for you or is really memorable for you um, I think the thing that stands out to me the most is that um, all of the athletes that I have met are so determined in everything they do, no matter what obstacles they face. Mm -hmm. They keep working hard and excelling in their sports, and that is so inspiring to me. For me, the most memorable thing was competing in alpine skiing and winning a bronze medal at the International Games in Austria. 
Wow. Yes, I would think that would be pretty memorable. I can't even imagine. I think that's so fantastic. And so have you made a lot of friends at the various games that you've attended? It sounds like probably, but I'm I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have made lots of lots of friends, and I still stay connected to some of them. That is one of the things I love about Special Olympics is the different people you meet, and it's also inclusive. That yeah, that's fantastic, and you know, and I know that's what we're trying to build, you know, in my little Down syndrome community is inclusiveness and acceptance. And so, you know, I think SOBC is is doing a fine job with that. And so, Scott, there are, I believe, as I was looking on your website, about 55 communities throughout BC that are involved in the Special Olympics. So how does one get involved in it? Mm -hmm. So on our website, if you go to that section, you will see contact details and um, a bit more information about each of those community programs. Um, so if you live in one of those communities, that would be a great place to start. Um, each of our communities has a, a local kind of council and uh, they're responsible for the programs and all that in those communities. Um, so they'd have a great idea of what's actually going on around you and what are the opportunities available. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get in touch with the provincial office okay. and depending on whether you're interested in volunteering or getting involved as an athlete or, or you just would like some more information, they would be a great source as well. And what's your website? We'll certainly put it in our links and the show notes and stuff, but so that people know www.specialolympics.bc.ca .bc .ca. okay perfect so when a joy when a child joins the special olympics i mean what do they get out of it i'm sure you both can answer this probably from a little bit different perspectives and i i have what i think but i would love to hear from both of you what you think uh kids these days get out of joining the special olympics of bc susan i'll, I'll let you go first <laughs> um sure <laughs> Um, so Special Olympics, the sports in Special Olympics are really fun and you can stay active. Mm -hmm. And um, they also give really good exercises that you can do at home, even if you're not at the sports you attend, especially now during the pandemic. It's a way for, it's a way for you to stay active while you're staying socially distanced and at home to try the exercises that's given by Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. And it's always so much fun. It sounds like it. And how old were you when you first started? Um, I was 14. Oh, okay. So I, I just with all your successes, I imagined you were a lot younger when you first started. And, so, <laughs> and Scott, what typical, like what's typically the age that kids start? It does change quite a bit mm -hmm. um, by the family. The youngest kids that we have coming in would be two years old mm -hmm. um, and they would be practicing mainly you know motor skills and some of those uh, hand-eye coordination and that type of thing that'll prepare them for entering sports when they're older mm -hmm. um, and then we have people that are involved well up into their 80s and 90s um, so we try and keep people involved throughout their entire lifespan. Oh I was wondering about that wow that is just so fantastic so and what do you think that people get out of being part of the Special Olympics? Um, so I think they're, they're the ones that are more obvious and those mm -hmm. are the benefits of participating in sport. Um, for a lot of this population, it can't be taken for granted that mm -hmm. if they sign up for a community program, the coach is going to give them the attention they deserve or mm -hmm. um, is going to have the skill set to truly help them develop. And that's one thing that we provide at Special Olympics is that opportunity to compete in a sport with a coach who's trained as a coach and who understands how to work with this population. Beyond that, I think what people often underestimate before coming into the Special Olympics is the community and support network mm -hmm. um, that people get from this. Uh, you know, everything from helping find friends to, to go out and hang out within the community to uh, talking to parents and trying to figure out where are the best services and, you know, who are the dentists that are going to be most reflective of our needs. And um, I think that can make a substantial difference in the lives of people. Um, and then beyond that, I think we also have a lot of opportunities for people to develop non-sport skills. Mm -hmm. um, so like Susan is a member of the Special Olympics board. Um, mm -hmm. She listed a, a bunch of cool interviews that she's done. She's been on TV um, we have another athlete, uh, Matthew Williams. He's done a TED Talk. Oh, wow. Um, 
yeah, beyond that, we also have our health programs. So um, we have opportunities to empower our athletes to do some health promotion work amongst their peers. Mm -hmm. um, we have some opportunities for people to come in and get health screenings that are um, given by practitioners that are um, catered to their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, so when people look at the Special Olympics, I think accurately we are a sports organization that can provide that um, competition, but there's also a lot more to the organization that people can explore. Yes, and I saw you talk at the National Down Syndrome Convention that I went to, the Canadian one, uh, in May of 2019. And so you just touched on it about how the health professionals will go into some of the different communities and do the health checks. And and I thought that was really fantastic. And And I do think you kind of nailed it on the head. It's like, you know, it's not just for the kids. It's also for the parents like that. You build that community because... I'm sure lots of people that are listening, they know how important it is to have your tribe, your community, like the people that will support you. And like you said, can give you advice on the dentist or the pediatrician, like, you know, you know, or, you know, I, we've had, um, our physio has been on early in the first season and I've sent lots of people to her because she's a miracle worker in my eyes. She got Ainsley walking in three weeks. I tried for a year, you know, so yeah, that, I think you totally, totally nailed it on the head there. So, and you also talked a little bit about it and like when, if someone is maybe like Ainsley, she's seven, cause I really would like to get her involved. It, it, we didn't get involved initially because she was a really late walker and, and, but now she's like pretty much running and, and so on. And she loves to climb. And so I, I definitely want to get her involved in special Olympics because sports has always been a big part of my life and I want it to be part of hers, but also you know, people with Down syndrome, they they tend to have a lower metabolic rate. So there's the risk of being overweight and often sedentary. So, you know, for me, that's important and also to, to grow that community. But you talked about like the youngest age is around two. So at what point, like Susan, she joined when she was 14. Like, do they go through sort of different kind of community programs where you said they kind of work on like high eye hand coordination things like that and then when do they sort of move on to like susan listed off a huge list of uh, sports that she's involved in so at, like at what point do they do kids i guess get involved in more of a more of a specific sport i guess is the question i'm asking yeah so we have our youth programs that are designed for youth and are designed to develop those initial sports and understanding of sports to get into the the full sport programs mm -hmm. um, so we have active start which is generally designed for kids age two to six okay. um, from there they move to fundamentals which mm -hmm. is ages seven to eleven um, and then sports start which is ages 12 to 18. okay that being said depending um, on the personal preferences of the individual participating. It is possible to join our sports programs at an earlier age, mm -hmm. um, but the option is there uh, to stay in the youth programs until you're 18. Oh, okay. Okay. That's great. So Susan, Scott sort of touched on a little bit, but something that I think is pretty cool is that you're involved in Special Olympics in, as more than just an Olympian and an athlete. So can you share about how else you're involved? in Special Olympics BC? Sure. Um, so I am the athlete representative on the BC Board of Directors mm -hmm. and the Leadership Council. Also, I just joined the communications group of the coalition. Wow, fantastic. And so how long have you been doing that then, being on the board? Um, for two years. My term is almost up. So. Oh, it's a term. Okay. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, that's wonderful. And then, Scott, on the SOBC website, I loved reading about the Special Olympics BC's mission and values. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, so our vision, uh, just before I get into it, sport will all, will open hearts and minds towards people with, into, people with intellectual disabilities and create inclusive communities all across BC. Mm -hmm. And I think when you really boil it down, that's what we're all about is um, as an organization, we want to create a community uh, where people with intellectual disabilities receive the same opportunities as everyone else and where they have the support needed to thrive. Um, and as an organization, everything that we do kind of comes down to that mm -hmm. in particular. So our values um, would be inclusion, diversity, empowerment, respect, and excellence. Um, and 
space. We just believe that if people with intellectual disabilities are empowered, they can achieve great things and um, be contributing members of our communities and can add value in ways that um, you know other other people can't. So um, that's what we're about as an organization, and the way that we try to achieve that is through sport. Fantastic. And I know we talked a little bit about it before, but you know, it's, there's so many different sports that a child can participate in, but like, for example, Ainsley, she hasn't been a part of special Olympics yet and she's seven. So she would be in the fundamental group or would she, you know, depending on her skill level or like, how does that work? Yeah. I, I think it would mostly be, um, in the fundamentals. So at that age, um, until you get to sports start, which is when they really start doing the sport specific skills, mm-hmm. um, a lot of it would be just uh, the simple motor skills. And uh, in terms of uh, whether or not she would stay an active start because she was um, new to the program, mm-hmm. I think it's more designed to be inclusive of everybody who would be within the 7 to 11 age bracket, whether or not they are new to Special Olympics or if they had participated in the active start program. Okay. As we all know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Who knows what's going to happen and you know things are somewhat back to normal but you know have what's happened during this time like because it's like activity and sports it's so important to our kids so what has SOBC been able to do or have you guys been able to continue anything during this time or have you restarted or initially during the shutdown we of course had to close our programs mm-hmm. um we did try to focus quite a bit on doing some things like uh, um, Facebook live workouts and um, at home workout calendars and um, activities like that to try and make sure that people stay engaged. And we're still mm-hmm. doing that mm-hmm. um, to quite uh, a large extent. But what we are finding is that it's not quite the same. No. Um, people in the Special Olympics community really depend on that um, social contact and, and that activity to maybe an extent that the general population wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've been really working hard to try and find ways that we can reintroduce our programs, but in a way that's safe. Um, right now we have four programs that we've just started up. We Mm -hmm. did a a pilot program in one community just to make sure that we had everything worked out. So we now have golf, um, track and field, club fit, and bocce would be the four ones that we have up and running. So um, to people out there in the Special Olympics community, um, if your community doesn't have that yet, um, we are working on trying to get it up and running, but uh, it's different for every community because we need to make sure that we have enough volunteers that are capable. We need to make sure we have facilities where um, social distancing is possible. Um, so our team at Special Olympics is working very hard to try and make sure that we can offer these programs to people around the province. Um, in it, to to the other sports that we're trying to add in. Um, it might take a little bit more time, but we are still working on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously a sport like floor hockey is going to be um, quite a bit uh, more difficult to figure out than a sport like bocce where it is individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're hoping to get these programs up and running um, and we're doing everything we can to try and make sure that we keep people engaged um, in the meantime. That's fantastic. And Susan, what? how have you found it during the pandemic that, have you been able to be engaged at all? Like Scott was saying, they did some Facebook lives and, and things like that. Were you able to participate in anything or how have you found it? Yeah, I try to always go on the Facebook live, mm-hmm. but it, it has been really hard to stay connected and to stay active. Mm-hmm. But I'm always trying my best and um, at using the exercises found on the Special Olympics website. And that has helped me a lot. Oh, that's great to hear. So I'm I'm glad because you got to stay in shape for the winter season, for the skiing season coming up, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, Scott, one of the other things I was going to ask is, like, I'm thinking of some smaller communities, maybe not necessarily in, B- well, I guess you can really, I don't know. If you're in a small community and there isn't a, uh, uh, a program I'm assuming you can just go to the next closest community or or how does it work? Yeah, um, generally speaking, uh, w- if you live in the province of BC, there's mm-hmm. a program within driving distance to you. There are a few communities um, such as Haida Gwaii. Uh, we're mm-hmm. at this moment. It's just not 
um, possible for us to run programs. Mm -hmm. But if you go on the Special Olympics website and you find that there is nothing near you, I still recommend that you get in touch with us um, and let us know uh, because there might be some opportunities that we're aware of. Um, and there might also be people from your community that are um, maybe carpooling to another community to participate in events or mm -hmm. um, are maybe starting, considering starting their own Special Olympics program as well. Um, so just because there isn't a program on the website, I think it doesn't mean that it's not worth reaching out and just letting us know that you're interested. Okay, that's fantastic to know. And would that be s sort of similar, I guess, for elsewhere, like outside of BC and Canada even? Like in the States or... I guess even, I mean, how many countries did you say? 160? At last count, it was 160. Um, so for the most part, if you live in um, Europe or the Americas, there's a, a, a program in your country. There are a few, um, you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa and the South Pacific yeah. where we're still hoping to get to. Wow. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you live anywhere in Canada, there's probably a pretty substantial program near your house and same in the U.S., that's fantastic to hear. So you kind of touched on a little bit, but like what age do you, the, like, so they're going through the programs when they're younger, like the, the fundamentals and the active start, when would they start competing? Like Susan started, she started with Special Limits BC when she was 14. I, I'm not sure, Susan, when you started competing, but do athletes compete according to their their age or and what are the different types of events we kind of touched on that a little bit local mm -hmm. um so we don't break it up by age we do a, a process called divisioning okay um which it, it may sound a little complicated um but in in a nutshell it means that we try and group people based on their ability mm -hmm. um so it's not necessarily this is the you know, 20 year old division, and this is a 30 year old division, right. okay. um, you could have somebody who's in their 70s and somebody who's in their 20s on the same team. Mm -hmm. um, and this has the effect of um, allowing everybody to elevate their game to the next level. Yeah. So if people want to make it to the world championships, you don't necessarily need to start as the most gifted athlete, you need to improve based on your baseline the most. So if you work hard, and if you're dedicated and committed to the sport you can still make it to compete on that international level we have the the 18 sports and each one of those sports would be individually um, done that way that's fantastic i know uh, this is a little bit off topic but when way back in the day when i was in high school i competed in gymnastics and it was actually the it was based on the same kind of model where it was based on we called it levels but it was the only all-inclusive sport that someone in high school could join and we had a couple of kids on our team who had some intellectual disabilities but they they were able to make it to the bc provincials which was a really big deal and uh you know which was fantastic like kendrick he was on the boys team and you know everyone was so supportive which is what i love to see with all the kids on the team they were all supportive of everyone but it was so exciting to see them compete and you know get some ribbons and and to perform you know and I thought it was fantastic because you know I remember trying to play I joined the basketball team but I never was good enough so I never made it or volleyball or whatever but for me I found that the gymnastics was all inclusive so you know and it's wonderful to hear that special olympics does it in the same way i kind of thought it was like that that because that's what makes the most sense is it based on your ability that anyone can join and like you said if you work hard and you persevere you can move forward and and but you're having fun and you're getting fit and all of those things so i think that's just really fantastic we chatted a little bit briefly before or through email i you know i had mentioned that i had you know, seen uh, Timothy Shriver speak. And I think you also said, Scott, that you'd seen him speak. And, you know, I one of the things that kind of really resonated with me from his talk is he, he, he showed a picture of a young girl that he has on his desk. And I don't know which Special Olympics it was at, but uh, she's standing in the seventh place podium, but she just has like so much joy on her face, like that she came seventh. It wasn't about the medal, like, you know, winning first place, but it reminded me so much of the Special Olympian oath about, <laughs> there's Ainsley in the background, <laughs> let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. And I think you touched a lot on that about, 
you know, uh, these athletes persevering and, and working hard. So I just wanted to share that, but I know you, where did you see him speak? I saw him at Special Olympics had our 50th anniversary in 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to Chicago for the celebrations and he spoke at that. And I, I got the chance to talk to him for a few minutes as well, which was um, really interesting. He's uh, quite an interesting guy. Wow. Fantastic. That, yeah, it, I'm sure that was pretty amazing because, yeah, his his talk was, you know, to us, he talked a lot about, you know, obviously his mom and and about uh, her sister, Rosemary, who had an intellectual disability. And that's where it all started, because she found that there wasn't anything for Rosemary. And I was surprised to learn that it was quite late that it had started in 68. I thought it was a, I thought it had been a little bit earlier, but but I'm so glad that, you know, that they started that because it's grown into such an amazing movement across the world. Like, it's incredible. And it's sorry, pretty interesting to see how far they've come in 50 years from a time when no one really thought it was possible to a global organization where um, people like Angela are thriving and um, participating on the board. And um, yeah, it's it's made a pretty big impact on the world, I think. So it's a fantastic organization. Yeah, like a lot of things have changed, like just, you know, with my daughter, you know, like you said, like 50 years ago, so much has changed for people with intellectual disabilities. My daughter has Down syndrome. Back, you know, 50 years ago, a lot of them were, you know, put in institutions. And I would had on an earlier podcast, um, Brian Donovan, he talked about how his sister, I think she was born in 69, I think, you know, but they brought her home and they raised her along with him and his brother and the neighborhood. And she was just part of the neighborhood. And I think we have to be inclusive and including our kids and, and getting them involved in, in sports, because I think sports is a big way to build that, um, teamwork and just, I know you talked a little bit about volunteering and, and so on. So like many nonprofits, volunteers play a pretty big part. So how does one go about volunteering? You sort of touched on it a little bit earlier, but for people who are interested. Yeah, we as an organization, we have, uh, Susan, you might know the more up-to-date numbers, but it's roughly 5,000 athletes and 5,000 volunteers. Is that correct? Um, about there. <laughs> yeah, about that. Yeah. So uh, for every athlete in our program, we do have a volunteer that's there supporting. Um, and these roles can be anything from you know, coming and helping out at an event and um, helping with registration to coaching to sitting on the local committee or uh, maybe you have an individual skill that you think you could um, use to help Special Olympics as an organization. Um, So there's no shortage of ways that people can get involved. um, And on all schedules, we're we're always very flexible to accommodate people's needs. Um, So if anyone out there is interested, I highly recommend that you either reach out to Special Olympics BC directly. Um, You can get in touch with us on our website, specialolympics.bc.ca, or you can look on the same website for some of the local committee contacts. So if you know what community you would like to volunteer in and you have a specific role in mind, um, I think that would be a great place to start. Oh, okay. You've planted a seed for me. (laughs) A little harder for me to volunteer these days, but I think that is something that would really love to do so I'm definitely gonna look into that and Susan can you share what impact Special Olympics has had on you personally? Sure um so Special Olympics has made a huge impact on me personally as a result of all the public speaking roles Mm -hmm. that I have done over the years I am much more confident and I can finally show my true colors Before joining Special Olympics, I was very shy and was scared of what people would think of me. Special Olympics has inspired me to always keep going and to never give up. My balance is also really terrible, so from all the sports I have participated in, such as alpine skiing, my balance has gotten a lot better. Oh, that's fantastic. We're... Um sorry go ahead Scott. sorry uh, susan you're being a little bit modest um you're <laughs> about to have a very big accomplishment coming up soon is that right with your education i am i'm planning to graduate from Kaplano next year oh fantastic well congratulations and what program did you take there um early childhood education program 
Oh, fantastic. Oh, yes. Don't be so modest. You got to share your accomplishments. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and were you a skier before you started with Special Olympics? Um, I think so. I started when I was 13. Wow, that's great. I, I mean, maybe there's still hope for me that I can learn to ski adequately. <laughs> maybe you can teach me. <laughs> I, I, and I do mean that. <laughs> I love to. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, that would be awesome. And so, Scott, I basically you've answered this question, but oh, sorry, I had one other question for Susan. But what would you say to people who have never participated in Special Olympics but would like to get involved? Like you said, you were kind of shy and maybe a bit nervous, and and I'm sure the first time you go to something, it it can be a little bit intimidating. But what would you say to people who are interested or curious about? Uh, being part of Special Olympics. Uh, is that for me? Or? Susan. Well, you both can answer, but... Oh, yeah. Sorry, Susan, <laughs> go for it. Um, so if someone wants to join Special Olympics, um, I would say that Special Olympics is truly amazing and life-changing. You will meet and connect with many different people and kind people. You can be who you are and have fun through the different sports that are offered. Fantastic. And... Well, Scott, you can answer that one too. Um, I would just say give it a shot. Um, whether or not you would um, fit in as an athlete or you think you just want to come out and check out the events, I think, what do you have to lose? Um, I think you'll find if you come to our events, you'll find a ton of people that thought they were going to come for one day. Maybe they got dragged to it by a friend or a family member or whatever it is. And then 40, 50 years later, um, you know, they're still here. And I think that says a lot about the experience that you get from it. Um, it's not just a, a volunteer opportunity or a chance to compete in sports. You really do um, develop a lot of skills. And I think it'll change the way, uh, at least to some extent, that you see your role in the community and you see the, uh, the role of sports in communities. Um, so I just say, come out, try it once. And if it's not for you, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um also, when I first joined, I also thought that I would be in Special Olympics for only a few years, mm -hmm. but now I'm going on to my 10th year, and I think I'll stay with it for my whole life, I would think. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'm sure, has many of your friends stayed with it as well, like, since you started? Um, yeah, many have. Um, I didn't know a lot of friends that are in Special Olympics before, but... Now that I have made money, um, yet they are always in Special Olympics, which is so great. Oh, that's wonderful. And I actually was just thinking, Scott, like, is there a cost for if you want to put your child, like, say, in the uh, fundamental program or in any of the programs, is there a cost to it? There are minimal uh, fees in each of the programs, and mm -hmm. it does depend a little bit on which program it is. So, mm -hmm. for example, something like a club fit would be cheaper than a downhill skiing yeah of course um, yeah. that being said though uh, all of our programs are very affordable mm -hmm. um, and if there ever is somebody who is unable to participate due to income we have programs in place to try and um, alleviate that so we'll never turn somebody away for for lack of um, funding so that's wonderful to hear and i'm kind of guessing that's probably across the board I would assume in not just for BC, but Canada, US and other countries, I would think. To the best of my knowledge, yeah. yes. Yeah, I could sort of see that being part of the mission. So is there anything else you would like to share, either one of you, about being part of SOBC or um, to share I think with our listeners? I would just say more generally, um, you know, people with intellectual disabilities are, are still a, a marginalized group in general. Mm -hmm. um, so whether or not you get involved with the Special Olympics um, or not, I think everybody has a role for trying to, to build a, a healthier, more inclusive community. So if you're a practitioner, take some time and read a little bit about the health needs of people with ID and how you can better serve them. If you're a, a school teacher, maybe go a little bit out of your way to try and make sure that the child with an intellectual disability in your program gets that extra support so that they can thrive like their peers. Um, so we hope you come and you join the Special Olympics, but even if this isn't for you, there's still a lot of ways that you can make a, a real difference in people's lives. So I, I hope you do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And Susan, was there anything else that you would like to add? Really too much. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to follow what Scott has said, and that Special Olympics is such a great organization that helps so many people. That's fantastic. I really want to thank both of you for coming on today and sharing your love and passion for the Special Olympics of BC and just Special Olympics. I know, you know, it's something I definitely want to get Ainsley involved in and because, you know, I think it, it's time for her to get into some other kind of activity other than, well, we don't have swim physio anymore, but <laughs> when it starts up again, but yes. And I, I definitely look forward to that and, and being part of the special Olympic BC community. So thank you both for taking your time to come on today and, and share your experiences with us. Thanks Thank you for, for having us. us. Oh, you're very welcome. And, and we'll chat, so, we'll chat soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So Mary, you guys touched in, the, in your conversation about some really high profile people that are involved that help set up the Special Olympics movement. Yes, and it was actually started by Eunice Shriver. And Tim Shriver, who I've mentioned previously on some episodes, he spoke at our uh, retreat, our last retreat, and he talked about the Special Olympics and he's involved in it. I believe he's the director of the Special Olympics. And it's because of the Kennedys, they had a sister named Rosemary who had an intellectual disability. And, you know, their their mom realized that there wasn't anything for her and needed, you know, felt that there needed to be something. And so she started the Special Olympics and I remember he touched on a, a really fantastic story at the retreat about how it was President Clinton was the first sitting president to actually attend uh, a, a Special Olympics. Um, I that, guess it was. Wow. It took that long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it the, I think it was a national event, I, I think. And all of the Olympians had been given, you know, those disposable cameras. And like to take pictures, you know, with their friends and of the event. And a photographer noticed that they were all looking through the camera like backwards. And so he went over to tell them like, you know, you're, you know, you're looking through the camera wrong. This is how you do it. And the Olympian said, oh, we know that. But if you look at it this way, you, it acts like a telescope so we can see the stage better and we can see the president better you know and it that's, was that, that that's a great story of you yeah know, listening you know a great story of listening to why people instead of demanding or asking that they you know look at use them the right way mm -hmm. let the creative people be creative yes and he said it was like a life-changing moment that photographer yeah. for him like where he thought they didn't know how to use it but they taught him something and so and i just i love that story and i thought it was amazing and you know they've done such amazing things for to to grow the special olympics and for it to be what it is today and so that all these people can be involved and people like susan she can say that she's an olympian and she has won a bronze medal i mean how many people have done that you know, gone to an international event and won a medal. Well, especially, especially a, a, an international sporting event mm -hmm. of that caliber. Yeah. So I think that's pretty darn impressive. So, you know, so there are chapters all over the world. So get your kids involved and look them up. I know they're, you know, things are a little bit different due to, you know, the COVID restrictions, but they are still doing things. Like I see them on Facebook. They do a Facebook kind of like meetup every week. And, you know, I sometimes join in to hear what they're talking about. And yeah, it's such a wonderful organization and dedicated to our kids. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought this one forward because this is a great story. Yeah, I loved it too. I really enjoyed talking with it's, them. It's it's a great story of ability. Exactly. So, okay, why don't you wrap this one up and we'll move on to preparing for our next show. 
Alrighty. Thanks for listening to the T21 Mum podcast. And as always, I would love to hear from you. Tell me your stories, what things interest you. You can reach me at info at t21mum.com or you can find me on Facebook, also at Instagram and Twitter at Trisomy21Mama. Keep on loving on your rocking kiddos and we will see you next time. See you, Mary. Take care. Thanks, Ron. Bye.